Chapter 21 The Theory of Consumer Choice Our goal in this chapter is to answer the following questions. How does the budget constraint represent the choices a consumer can afford? How do indifference curves represent the consumer's preferences? What determines how a consumer divides her resources between two goods? How does the theory of consumer choice explain decisions such as how much a consumer saves or how much labor she supplies? Introduction People face trade-offs, one of the first principles we learned in Chapter 1. Buying more of one good leaves less income to buy others. Working more hours means more income and more consumption, but less leisure time. Reducing savings allows more consumption today, but reduces future consumption. This chapter explores how consumers make choices like these. Let's start by studying the budget constraint. What the consumer can afford. Budget constraint is the limit on the consumption bundles that a consumer can afford. For example, Holly divides his income between two goods, fish and mangoes. A consumption bundle is a particular combination of the goods, for example, 40 fish and 300 mangoes. Let's look at an example of a budget constraint by looking at active learning one. Holly's income is 1200. The price of F or fish is $4 per fish and the price of mangoes is a dollar per mango. Number A, if Harley spends all his income on fish, how many fish does he buy? Number B, if Harley spends all his income on mangoes, how many mangoes does he buy? Number C, if Harley buys 100 fish, how many mangoes can he buy? Number D, Plot each of the bundles from part A to C on a graph that measures fish on the horizontal axis and mangoes on the vertical axis. Connect the dots. And this is what we do. Uh, number A, with the $1,200, you can buy 300 fish. Number B, uh, you can buy 1,200 mangoes. Number C, 100 fish cost $400 and 800 is left to buy 80 mangoes. When you connect the dots, you have a budget constraint. This is Harley's budget constraint that shows the bundles he can afford. From C to D, a rise 200 mangoes a run 50 fish, that's the slope of this line, is negative 4. What that means is Holly must give up 4 mangoes to get 1 fish. The slope of the budget line or the budget constraint is the opportunity cost. In other words, the slope of the budget constraint equals the relative price of the good on the x-axis. Initial problem was Harley's income had, was $1,200 and the price of, of fish was $4 per fish and mango was a dollar per mango. So what happened to Harley's budget constraint if number A, his income falls to $800. Number B, the price of mango rises to $2 per mango. The answer now Harley can buy 800 divided by 4, that is 200 fish, or 800 divided by a dollar, that is 800 mangoes, 
or any combination of that. In other words, a fall in income shifts budget constraint down or inwards. Number B, part B, Harley can still buy 300 fish. The price of fish did not change, but now he can only buy 1,200 divided by two, and that is 600 mangoes. Notice slope of is smaller relative to price of fish is now only two mangoes. An increase in the price of one good pivots the budget constraint inwards. What are consumer wants preferences? Measure them using indifference curves. And what are indifference curves? Shows consumption bundles that gives the consumer the same level of satisfaction. And this is one of Harley's indifference curves. A, B, and all other bundles on I, or indifference curve, makes Harley equally happy. He is indifferent between them. Indifference curves are downward sloping. There are four properties of indifference curve. The first one is indifference curves, as you can see, downward sloping. If the quantity of fish is reduced, the quantity of mangoes must be increased to keep Harley equally happy. Proper, the second property, higher indifference curves are preferred to lower indifference curve. Holly prefers bundles to, like point number C, to every bundle on one or point like A. The higher, the better. He prefers every bundle on I1, like A, to bundle like I sub zero, like D. Number three, indifference curves cannot cross. That is logical inconsistency. Halley should prefer B to C, because B is on higher indifference curve. Yet Harley is indifferent between B and C. He likes C as much as A, both are on I4. He likes A as much as B, both are I1. As you can see, indifference curves cannot cross. Number four, indifference curves are bowed inwards or convex. Halley is willing to give up more mangoes for a fish if he has few fish, that is point number A, than if he has many, like point number B. So here at point A, he is willing to give up six mangoes to get one fish. But when we get to point number B, he's willing to give us only two mangoes to get one fish. The marginal rate of substitution, or MRS, the rate at which a consumer is willing to trade one good for another. Harley's MRS is the amount of mangoes he should substitute for another fish. MRS is also the slope of indifference curve. MRS is the slope of indifference curve. MRS falls as you move down along an indifference curve. It is high here, 6 to 1, but as you move along indifference curve, it is low here, 2 to 1. Extreme case of perfect substitutes. 
Perfect substitutes are two goods with a straight line in different curves. That means the marginal rate of substitution is constant. The slope of a straight line is a constant. For example, nickels and dimes are perceived to be perfect substitutes. Consumer is unwilling to trade, consumer is willing to trade two uh, nickels for one dime anytime. So nickels measured on the vertical axis and dimes measured on the horizontal axis are perfect substitutes. Therefore, they have straight line marginal rate of substitution or straight line in different curves. Another extreme case is the case of perfect complements. Perfect complements are two goods with right angle in different curves, right angle, 90 degrees. For example, your left shoes and your right shoes are perfect complement. You can't wear one shoe without the other. So seven left shoes and five right shoes is just as good as five left shoes and five right shoes. Close substitutes and close complements. The graph on the left shows uh, indifference curve for close substitutes are not very bowed. They are fairly uh, flat, more closer to straight line. Uh, indifference curves for close complement are very bowed, more close to right, right angle indifference curves. What the consumer chooses? Consumer preference. A is optimum. The point on the budget constraint that touches the highest possible indifference curve. That is the optimum point of consumer choice. Halle prefers B to A, but he cannot afford B. So A is the best he can do which is on the budget line. So the point where indifference curve is tangent to the budget line is the optimum or consumer equilibrium. Holly can afford C and D, but is on a higher, but A is on a higher indifference curve. So Holly will prefer A to C or D. The optimum is the bundle Halle must prefer, most prefers, out of all the bundles he can afford. The keyword he can afford. What the consumer chooses at the optimum slope of the indifference curve equals slope of the budget constraint. That is the point of tangency. The slope of indifference curve is tangent to the budget constraint. That is the optimum. That is the consumer equilibrium. Point number A. The consumer cannot do any better than this given his or her income. And so at that point is defined by this algebraic equation. MRS or the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of the price of fish divided by the price of mango. Consumer optimization is another example of thinking at the margin. The marginal value of fish in terms of mangoes is equal to the price of fish in terms of mangoes. Marginal thinking. An increase in income shifts the budget constraint outward. If both goods are normal, Harley buys more of each. And so in this case, Harley moves from point A to the new equilibrium point number B. At that point, Harley has purchased more mangoes and also purchased more fish. 
active learning exercise, defining inferior versus normal good. An increase in income increases the quantity demanded of normal goods and reduces the quantity demanded of inferior goods, and vice versa. Suppose fish is a normal good, but mangoes are inferior goods. Use a diagram to show the effects of an increase in income on Harley's optimal bundle of fish and mangoes. This is the graph, and we start from equilibrium or opt, uh, uh, consumer equilibrium at point number A. If mangoes are inferior, the new optimum will contain fewer mangoes. So if income goes up, let's see the new equilibrium. The new equilibrium is at B. B is still preferred to A. But what has happened is that you can see that now you are consuming fewer mangoes, but more fish. Increase in income will lead to consumption of more normal good, but less inferior goods. Effect of a price change. Initially, the price of fish is $4, and the price of mango is a dollar. If the price of fish falls to $2, Budget constraint rotates outward, like you see here. The new equilibrium is established. This fellow is consuming fewer mangoes from 600 to 500 because mangoes are inferior, but consuming more fish from 150 to 300 because fish is a normal good. So here, price falls to $2, budget constraint rotates outward, and Harley buys more fish and fewer mangoes. The income and substitution effects. A fall in the price of fish has two effects on Harley's optimal consumption of both goods. Number one, income effect. A fall in price of fish boosts the purchasing power of Harley's income and buys more mangoes and more fish. The substitution effect, a fall in the price of fish makes mangoes more expensive relative to fish and Harley buys fewer mangoes and more fish. The net effect, on mangoes is ambiguous. Initial optimum at point number A, price falls and the budget constraint rotates outwards, and we see substitution effect from A to B, buy more fish and fewer mangoes. From A to B, buy more fish and fewer mangoes. So income effect, movement from B to C, buy more of both goods. From B to C, buy more of both goods. Active learning four. Do you think the substitution effect would be bigger for substitutes or complements? Draw an indifference curve for Coke and Pepsi, and on a separate graph, one for hot dogs and hot dog buns. On each graph, show the effects of a relative price change keeping the consumer on the initial indifference curve. The answers, these are two indifference curves. The one on the right is flatter, the one on the left is steeper. 
in both graphs, the relative price change by the same amount. And so we establish initial point A and the change in price moves them to B. But the substitution effect is bigger for substitutes than for income, for uh, complement. Price of fish, when the price of fish is $4, Halle demands 150 fish, as you can see here. When the price of fish is $2, Halle demands 350 fish, as you can see. And that is the new indifference curve. You can use that to derive the demand for fish. So this is deriving Halle's demand curve for fish from the given indifference curve. Application one, given goods. Do all goods obey the law of demand? Suppose the goods are potatoes and meat and potatoes are an inferior good. If price of potatoes rise, substitution effect, which means buy less potatoes, income effect, which means buy more potatoes. The income effect is larger than substitution effect. Uh, then uh, potatoes are a given good, a good for which an increase in price raises the quantity demanded. This is a diagram or a given good. An increase in the price of potatoes rotates the budget constraint inwards from B to D. Number two, this uh, increases potato consumption if potatoes are a given good. An increase in the price of potatoes rotates the budget constraint inward, which increases potato consumption if potatoes are a given good. Application two, wages and labor supply. Budget constraint shows a, pers a person's trade-off between consumption and leisure. It depends on how much time she has to divide between leisure and working. The relative price of an hour of leisure is the amount of consumption she should buy, she could buy with an hour's wage. Indifference curve. It shows the bundles of consumption and leisure that give her the same level of satisfaction. Wages and labor supply. As you can see, the optimum is the point of tangency. At the optimum, the marginal rate of substitution between leisure and consumption equals the wage rate. That is the consumer optimum, consumer equilibrium. Application two, wages and labor supply. An increase in wage has two effects an optimal quantity of labor supplied. That is a substitution effect, means a higher wages, a higher wage makes leisure more expensive relative to consumption. The person chooses less leisure and increases quantity of labor supplied. The income effect, with a higher wage, she can afford to more, uh, she can afford more of both goods. She chooses more leisure, reduces quantity of labor supply. Wages and labor supply. 
When the wages rise, as you can see, the budget constraint tilts outward. Hours of leisure decrease because people have to go to work. And hours of labor increase. More people are claiming these higher wages. At this point, a substitution effect is still larger than income effect. So her labor supply increases with the wage rate. If, however, we start with this equilibrium, when the wage rate rises, and therefore the budget constraint is shifted out, not tilted out, hours of leisure increase, and hours of labor will decrease. At this point, for this particular person, substitution effect is less than the income effect. So his labor supply falls when the wages rise. Could this happen in the real world? Well, cases where the income effect on the labor supply is very strong. Over the last 100 years, technological progress has increased labor demand and real wages. The average work week fell from six to five days. When a person wins the lottery or receives an inheritance, his wage is unchanged, hence no substitution effect. But such a person, uh, such persons are more likely to work fewer hours, indicating a strong income effect. Application three interest and saving. A person lives for two periods. Period one is young and works and earns $100,000 a year. And consumption is $100,000 a year minus whatever he saves. Period two, uh, old, retired, consumption is equal to saving per period. Uh, is equal to saving from period one plus interest earned on uh, saving. The interest rate determines the relative price of consumption when young in terms of consumption when old. Interest rate and savings. This budget constraint shows shown is for 10% interest, beginning with optimum. At the optimum, the marginal rate of substitution between current and future consumption equals the interest rate. Active learning, change in the interest rate. Suppose the interest rate rises. Describe the income and substitution effect on current and future consumption and on savings. The interest rate rises, substitution effect. Current consumption becomes more expensive relative to future consumption. Current consumption falls, saving rises, and future consumption rises. Income effect can afford more consumption in both the present and the future, and savings falls. A higher interest rate raises savings. A higher interest rate rotates the budget constraint outward. Number two, the re resulting in lower consumption when young and thus higher savings. In this case, substitution effect is larger than income effect and saving rises. In this diagram, a higher interest rate rotates the budget constraint outward, resulting in higher consumption when young 
and thus lower savings. In this case, substitution effect is smaller than income effect and saving falls. Conclusion. Do people really think this way? People do not make spending decisions by writing down their budget constraints and indifference curves. Yet they try to make the choices that maximize their satisfaction given their, income, their limited resources. The theory in this chapter is only intended as a metaphor for how consumers make decisions. It explains consumer behavior fairly well in, in many situations and provides the basis for more advanced economic analysis. In summary, a consumer's budget constraint shows the possible combinations of different goods she can buy given her income and the price of goods. The slope of the budget constraint equals the relative price of the goods. An increase in income shifts the budget constraint inwards. A change in the price of one of the goods pivots the budget constraint. A consumer's indifference curve represents her preference. An indifference curve shows all the bundles that give the consumer a certain level of happiness. The consumer prefers points on the higher indifference curves to points on lower ones. The, slow, the slope of an indifference curve at any point in the marginal is the marginal rate of substitution. And the marginal rate of substitution, or MRS, is the rate at which the consumer is willing to trade one good for another. The consumer optimizes by choosing the point on her budget constraint that lies on the highest indifference curve. At this point, the marginal rate of substitution equals the relative price of the two goods. When the price of a good falls, the impact on the consumer's, on the consumer's choices can be broken down into two effects, an income effect and substitution effect. The income effect is the change in consumption that arises because a lower price makes the consumer better off. Movement from a low indifference curve to a higher one. The substitution effect is the change that arises because a price change encourages greater consumption of the good that has become relatively cheaper. Movement along an indifference curve. The theory of consumer choice can be applied in many situations. It can explain why demand curves can potentially slope upward, why higher wages could either increase or decrease labor supply, and why higher interest rates could either increase or decrease savings.